standing salute to Deputy Chairman Fred Hampton and to uh, Defense Captain, Deputy Defense Captain Mark Clark for his sacrifices December 4th, 1969. Uh, in this salute, I would like to read the 10 point program. We want freedom. We want the power to determine the destiny of our black and oppressed communities. We want full employment for our people. We want an end to the robbery by the capitalists of our black and oppressed communities. We want an end to the robbery by the capitalists of our black and oppressed communities. We want decent housing fit for the shelter of human beings. We want decent education for our people that exposes the true nature of this decadent American society. We want education that teaches us our true history and our role in the present day society. We want an immediate end to police brutality and the murder of black people, other people of color, and all as oppressed people inside the United States. We want an immediate end to all wars of aggression. We want, an, we want freedom for all black and oppressed people now held in US federal, state, county, and city, and military prisons and jails. We want trials by a jury of peers for all persons charged with so-called crimes under the laws of this country. We want land, bread, housing, education, clothing, justice, peace, and, and people's community control of modern technology. This is the 10-point program as we edit it. Uh, it is the foundation of all the thinking of the Black Panthers. It was the distinction that Fred Hampton brought to the south side of Chicago was a political analysis. And so we salute that in the traditional words of the Black Panthers, all power to the people. All power to the people. Thank you, ancestors and comrades for your sacrifices. The Black Panthers rolled out, was based in what we started this tribute with, and that is the 10 Point Program. Okay. And where we are now necessitates that this generation evolves that political analysis. It's about science, it's about politics, it's about class struggle. Mm -hmm. uh, and politics are the politicians don't care. No, we <laughs> create our own and you in Detroit a few weeks ago, we delivered what 95% of the registered voters. Mm -hmm. 95%, that was political power. Participatory politics, 95%. We delivered 95%. That means that in this upcoming election, we decide exactly who goes in. And hold them accountable. Mm -hmm. And hold them accountable. Yes. And those who haven't been accountable in this upcoming election in Detroit, we are removing them. Yes. If you haven't been accountable mm -hmm. in Detroit, that 95% registered voters mean we are removing you. Mm -hmm. And so prepare for accountability. We only want to hear the rhetoric of prepare for what your votes look like. Yeah. So get your voting record up. All that rhetoric, put your voting record up. Let's see how you voted on the issues that matter to us. Right. I faced eviction, how did you vote? Yeah. Nandis faced all type of water issues, yes. trying to provide education for our people. How did you vote? Yes. Businesses. Yes. How did you vote? Yes. Education for our youth. Yes. How did you vote in Detroit? Did you give it away? If you did, you out of there this time. Yeah. Honorable ancestors like Brother Fred Hampton, uh, Brother Bobby Seal, Huey we feed? You know what I mean, like. Uh, I know that they contributed heavily, and I honor their contributions. All right, so that's what brings me. Um, it is a, a blessing and an honor to uh, have the opportunity to be sitting here uh, next to a brother such as yourself. Um, it's a mutual honor. But, uh, what, I, what I would like to contribute right now is that uh, whoever, whoever's listening.
listening to whoever's paying attention to this, to what I'm saying right now, whoever's hearing. Study trust law. Figure out what a, you know, look into like a, not just a living trust or a wheel, but look into like an irrevocable common law trust. I was living in the South when As a Black Panther, I was, I have served like 36 years, as a Black man, I've served like 36 years in prison. Uh, some of that time I was a political prisoner, other times I was a prisoner of war. Uh, people ask, how did you become a Black Panther? Um, I was one of the, one of probably the only Black Panther who I know who came to the Black Panthers uh, because of a counterintelligence program that resulted in me reportedly being shot by Black Panthers. And so my introduction to Chairman Fred Hampton and to the command structure of the Illinois chapter was with bullet holes, dripping pus, and blood, uh, an armed cadre of Black Panthers led by Fred Hampton who had come to resolve this issue. And uh, within minutes, he explained why I had three bullet holes. Not explained, he explained that the Black Panthers had no culpability in this. That in fact, it was a counterintelligence program. And he was so sincere in his apology until when I took word of that back to the Black Peace Star Nation, uh, we avoided what could have been a disastrous war because uh, men had been shot in our community uh, reportedly by Black Panthers, which was never ever confirmed. Okay, and but the wonder was it, it was true. There were I was shot twice. Five of the young men up under my command in our neighborhood were shot. And uh, this shooting uh, was thought to be defensive. You know, uh, here we are, young street warriors. We holding our blocks down. And under force, we're escorting some people out of our neighborhood not understanding how complex that became, that our attempt to defend our neighborhood uh, resulted in us putting some people's lives at risk. And anytime anybody, police, criminal, daddy, anybody forces you to move according to their will against your will, you have the right to use deadly force. You have an obligation to defend yourself. The wonder of it was that in the middle of this, these people who were proclaimed to be Black Panthers, right, fired 15, 16 rounds, and they deliberately shot to wound. They shot five of the soldiers directly under my command in the arms and leg and the side. begging in a point blank range shootout under a project. Brother, please stop reaching for guns. Please stop them when they suppress this, the, the circumstance, including shooting me twice. They walked away. And so when we talk about what was the dynamic, here we were in a situation where the Blackstones and when you say the Blackstones, Blackstones, the Almighty Black Peace Stone Nation, mm -hmm. which is uh, which was a civil rights organization mm -hmm. and a spiritual organization on the south side of Chicago, okay. 
it was the place, it was the place where I saw the first man who I, whose command I obeyed outside of my father. That was Jeff Ford. Young brother, maybe seven years older than me. And I remember big homie walking through the hood and me the eldest son said, I'm gonna be like that. Yeah. I'm gonna be respected. Yeah. And so for us at that point, uh, when my mom and them bought their house over there in the white neighborhood, when they jumped on us going to school, when they got big homie in them, yeah. and they walked us to school. And the white supremacists, when they met black warriors, backed up, and we were able to go to school. Exactly. That, and what we call street gangs, uh, under the five and the six, are one of the most prolific and historically successful organizing uh, efforts and directions of our people. We have in every single family that I have, the majority of families that I've ever talked to, that have somebody either under the five or the six point star representing what are called the street gangs, which originally did not come from the criminal element, came from the financing of our civil rights movement. Martin Luther King then brought our scholars in to teach us what the red, black, and the green meant that Africa was not a myth that was made up in a Tarzan movie. They sent to the mighty men of valor of our generation. I was the eldest son, and I'm talking about Dr. Ben, and all of them came into our into places like this, and they, all, they held meetings called topographical research, and they, you know, I was like, there's like a real Africa, because we did not know. We we're only third, fourth generation uh, in the 50s, out of the Emancipation Proclamation. So leadership, what has occurred is that our people have mobilized in every metropolitan area. We have allowed the criminalization of black self-defense by not honoring uh, age-old traditions of teaching our men and women to be valorous, to be self-sacrificing for the good of our community. Uh, but we have the army. We have the army, and all of a sudden, COVID-19, right? And guess what? The boys in the hood are singularly important once again. Shut down, unk, cuz, and them. Singularly important to the security of 90s. Boys who people consider, you know, COVID-19 has created an intersection. And so we have that structure. We need to support it. We need to support our men and our women in leadership. We need to move in solidarity. We need to move very deliberately, economically. Uh, spiritually and all of these are things that we are doing. We simply need to use spaces and places like uh, what Brother Knox represents, Indian for Black Liberation, mm -hmm. and the unity of indigenous people. What right. Sister Sahar represents is the uh, historical unity between the Black Panthers and Black folks and the oppression of uh, Palestinian people. Were the Black Stones fighting against the Black Panthers? Because as they say in our community, we always fight against each other. In the Black community, was that the same issue with the Black Stones and the Black Panthers? No, it was exactly the opposite of that. Um, I was what you call a Pigou chief. I was the leader of a couple of neighborhoods, a couple of neighborhoods had elected me to give me the power to defend the neighborhood. And the majority of the men and women in our neighborhoods followed that command. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when the shooting took place, what could easily have been a war, because it was the assault in our community that nobody understood how it even happened. 
So when the big homies and them questioned me about it, their sophistication was that when they heard they wounded our soldiers deliberately, they looked at me and said, let them come in our territory. They down like that. He was like, and they said, so what's your decision? And I was standing in front of uh, some of the commanders, you know? And I dare not lie or be less than a man or they would strip you of your colors. And I said, okay, they, whoever these people were, they acted in self-defense. And my orders were, go talk to them families, go find out what they're about. Okay. Do you think that, um, speaking of, um, having leaders in the community, is, is that something we can start uh, try to implement today or is already implemented somewhere and people don't know about it? Because I always thought that we needed, you know, we talk about uh, the mayor, the uh, council people, the president, the vice president. I always thought if we had that in our own community, then we, we, we are our own mayors, we are our own presidents, just on a block club situation. You know, they have all these names for different things, but I mean, we have to have that for ourselves. It should be an elder that we can talk to, that that's commanded, that, you know, it's that same thing as if, um, before you got home, you did something, somebody called, and you hoping they didn't tell your mom. You know, that that's type right. of thing, you know. Uh, how do we pull that back? It's, uh, we're in a time where it seems that um, all nations need to come together. But we've always said that as black people, as African people, all nations, all people, all, you know, like how, you know, the Black Panther says, um, you know, white power. Mm -hmm. we, we, we want everybody to be good. But <clears throat> right now it's time for us to be good and look out for ourselves. We don't mean no selfish behavior, but hell, they've been selfish all their lives. So it's about us building up our nation now in our community, you know, because now we're free to read. We're free to gather. We're free to understand each other and talk. Where at one point we couldn't meet, we couldn't do all this together as, as our own people. So now um, I think the Creator has given us the opportunity to um, to talk about these things and teach our youth, teach our young how to behave, you know, how to love each other. It's okay to uh, do certain things. The political analysis of the Black Panther Party, mm -hmm. you know, housing, housing yes. also means this yes. is a house for us. Yes. Not means it's a house for us. Yes. Yes. Hey, how many times have you cleared this and been laid out everything? Whole tribes come, it's a yes. home. We yes. want housing, fit yes. for the shelter of human beings. That That's means right. that we must have affordable water. That's right. Right. It, it, it's not one time that a brother or sister don't walk in here and say um, that I'm hungry or mm -hmm. I need some clothes and that I don't feed them or try to clothe them. You know, because um, society, this society that we're in, have, we, we say these people are crazy that's walking down the street, but it's been a mental war on on these people, these youth that have just been thrown out of the foster care system. Mm -hmm. I was a foster parent for eight years, and I know they just use them. Mm -hmm. they're, they're like little pawns, and let me get that one, let me get that one. You know, we can get $3,000 on it, we can get $8,000 on it, but do they care about that child? So they throw these children out of foster care on drugs. They are putting them on Seroquel. They are putting them on Benadryl. I once had this little young boy, and I said, what kind of, um, uh, um, he was taking Benadryl. I said, what are you allergic to? You know, allergy medicine. He said, well, they just give it to us, you know, to put us so we can go to sleep at night. How crazy is that? 
give them a book and let them read and make you fall asleep. But that's part of the system. So it's like we got to get our young youth, we got to watch the youth that's in these systems. Exactly. Because when I, they used to come to my home, I said, now I got to deprogram you. It's not, I hate the word program, program, because you're programming their mind. So you got to deprogram these youth. And it, it, it's, it's very hard because, um, you know, um, once the drugs is in your system, your, your system craves them. So they move to harder drugs. You know, um, then they talk about the pharmaceutical companies. Now that the drugs have hit the white community so hard, well, let's do something about them. Yeah, and let's, let's make that uh, a future conversation okay. that we sit down and have. Mm -hmm. But I mean that I have spent uh, over 36 years in the Michigan Department of Corrections, mm -hmm. and I have seen, you know, literally thousands of young people come straight out of the foster care system mm -hmm. and straight into prison yes. and never understand yes. how mm -hmm. uh, they were set on yes. such a disastrous past, mm -hmm. exactly. myself included. Oh my I have never been an evil person. I have sinned. I have made some great mistakes. Mm -hmm. But to have spent nearly 40 years of my life in yeah. a cage, yeah. praise yeah. God that I'm able yeah. to return to society yeah. and function. Yes. But there are hundreds of thousands of mm -hmm. men and women enslaved in prisons yes. across the country. Mm -hmm. And they set that track part mm -hmm. through helpless victims, uh, our children mm -hmm. in foster care, wow. whose parents, for whatever reason, and a very large percentage of yeah. them are headed straight, straight to a lifetime yeah. of enslavement yeah. and others yeah. Profiting yes. off of their incarceration. Yes. Yes. On a personal perspective, um, I had the opportunity to do a field trip with some really big brain people, I mean, some really smart brothers and sisters. And to they, listen they, to they, really them. smart. Really smart. Anthropologists, archaeologists, our friends. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, yeah. And uh, PhDs and masters, mm -hmm. and they've been studying. And what they pointed out was the numbers, numbers. A uh, hundred plus million Africans uh, over a 450 year period of time in trying to land the slave trade, a specific uh, area, era, people <coughs> in history that was the enslavement of Africans specifically to North America and its impact on indigenous people uh, uh, and so forth. Yeah. But that 150 that hundred plus million people, mm -hmm. and there's a range, and there's mm -hmm. great debate in that mm -hmm. number, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, 450 years later, four million Africans emancipated themselves. Mm -hmm. Our ancestors mm -hmm. fought like hell. Mm -hmm. White folks ain't, ain't emancipated, mm -hmm. no black folks. Mm -hmm. We fought like hell, then we had to yeah. run back to yeah. the plantations yeah. before the mad ass racists yeah. got back to the plantations yeah. and killed everything there. Yeah. We had to yeah. fought like hard. Four yeah. million of us yeah. survived yeah to the census, yes. that's not counting all the massacres yes. and all that stuff and yes. people just adrift. Yes. That four million, 157 years later, is 50 million. Mm -hmm. In spite, mm -hmm. despite mm -hmm. the continued genocide, we're 50 million strong mm -hmm. and we to our babies. Yes. 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 And so we know mm -hmm. we got this. I'm, uh, watching a movie right now it has 69 episodes i stumbled on it it's called la escalaba blanca mm. and so i got into about 30 something episodes that were reading subtitled in spanish and um i looked it up it means white slave girl mm -hmm. and so i um uh, it's dealing with um the africans in um that were enslaved in south america mm -hmm. And it was, it's deep in the, the history that you can pull from it. We know the TV can put their own story in it because it sells the movie. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I said, if y'all get a chance, a look at that movie. Um, and um, we were some great warriors. Uh, black folks didn't lay down. They, they didn't lay down. It, 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 it was always a fight and a struggle in uh, being a slave. And being a slave, and so we bring it up today, we're mentally slave. So how are we gonna get our people out of this mental slavery? I wanna
relate that to the uh, ten point program of the Black Panthers. And number ten, we want land, bread, housing, education, clothing, justice, peace, and people's community control of modern technology. And so I wanted to ground what I heard from you in these principles and uh, and it's interesting to know the evolution of the historical perspective that you just barely touched on, but I know it's deep, but also how it evolves and comes into this day so that we can deliver that to your child. Tiffany is the Detroit COVID bus. Uh, and this sister has an interesting story and narrative about uh, how she got to this table. Uh, I think the first time that I met her is, and her sister and some of the family, uh, she simply said, uh, I want to learn about revolution. Yoga, uh, Yoda vibes, uh, Knox, uh, and others, uh, and I, with the support of A, uh, the, what is the Midwestern Regional Director? Uh, I believe it's uh, the Western State, uh, Western Side of the State. Yeah, uh, bought authorization and approval and support for uh, the movement that we launched, and that is Indians for Black Liberation. And that is to create more intersectionality in our struggle, uh, more identity, and to tell the truths of, uh, of indigenous and African uh, interactions in history. And so we look forward to uh, sharing with Mama Nandi uh, a series of tiny desks where we explore these issues, the politics, the history, the economics. I deal primarily with uh, activists and uh, young people who are very uh, uh, awoke, who are consciously seeking education, uh, constantly seeking political power. But political power necessitates that you study uh, navigate through power, and that means politics. So one of the things that we do with all activists and who we interact with is we help them to uh, learn what their civil rights are, what their constitutional rights are, what their human rights are. And uh, that helps with protests, with deciding where to invest your time, how to protect yourself legally, constitutionally, uh, internationally. Uh, so through righteous struggle, where skills and law become applicable,